Can you hear me? You see, there is something this morning that the devil may not want you to hear. But that's all right. By the grace of God, we're going to deliver what I believe the Lord has given us. And I'm going to say something to you right now that pastor said a long time ago. I don't know exactly what you came for this morning, but you'd better buckle up and fasten your seatbelts. Because it may be a rough ride for some of you. And too many times we come to church to be pacified. We come to church to have a bottle stuck in our mouth and then just leave me alone. I came this morning to stir your nest. I don't normally do a lot of notes. But there was a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention and by the grace of God I don't endeavor to be before you too long but I know when we say that as preachers we often wind up being there far longer than we had intended and far longer than most of you all can stand <laughs> but by his grace this morning We're going to endeavor to be short, precise, and to the point. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we're asking that you would anoint us to preach and to teach your word. Lord, let the preacher come. Lord, let the deliverance of your word dwell in the heart of each one, O oh God. For, Lord, we're nothing of ourselves. But, God, you have made us and you've chosen us and you've called us into this marvelous light. Lord, help us to walk in that light. For Lord, in you there is no darkness, neither shadow of turning from you. Lord, help us today to be the servant that you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. And this morning, we're gonna talk about a, a perpetual dwelling. And that comes from two points that I have in mind. And one is that you should be a perpetual dwelling place for God. Amen. Second, he is a perpetual dwelling place for you if you will avail yourself to what he has called you to. If you will keep his commandments, you will continually, incessantly abide in him. If you will keep his commandments as he has told you, if you will love him as you ought, there will be no great failures in your life. There will be nothing that you cannot overcome if you perpetually abide in him. Amen. See, too many of us want to say, come, and we run over here and we get a touch and the next thing you know, we, you don't see us for months. But let me tell you something this morning, church. God is not interested in any half measures. God will not accept your half measures. We haven't seen you. We haven't heard from you. You haven't been sick. But yet you fail to show up in the house of God. And he said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm God and I change not. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is. Some of you need to come to church and repent. Don't come in here shouting without repentance. Shouting without repentance tells me that you do not fear God. I don't care whether you like me or not. I didn't come to be liked. God didn't call me to preach whether you, whether you like me or not. They hated Jesus simply because he told them the truth. You're going to hate the man or woman of God that will not spare for your indiscretions. If you're in sin, God is saying, come out. He's saying, quit your wicked ways and hold on to his unchanging hand. For if you will avail yourself and put yourself in God's hand, he said, no man can pluck you out. You're foolish if you choose to walk out. And that's what the majority of the church world is doing today. They're walking away from God and saying, that preacher... 
that sister, that brother. No, it's you that have failed to stay faithful to God. It's you that have failed to keep your commitment. It's you that have failed to stay dedicated unto him. It's you that are missing the will of God for your life. Too many of us want to point a finger at somebody else. But it's not about pointing fingers this morning. It's about humbling myself before God and crying out to him and saying, Lord, you called me in righteousness. Lord, you promised that if I would walk right, you'd hold my hand. Lord, you promised me that no evil would overtake me. Lord, you promised that whatever trials and tribulations came my way, nothing would befall me. No temptation would overtake me that I would not be able to overcome for you have made the way of escape. God is your way of escape, not the courts, not the lawyers, not some slick tongue preacher talking, but God is your way out. He's your way up. He's your way over. He's your way through whatever trial you face. And too many of us are looking for another way. But there is no other way. He's so high that you can't go over him. He's so low that you can't go under. And so wide you can't go around. You must come through the door. Jesus Christ and him crucified is your mean of salvation. There beside them there is no other. And until you come to that point and accept that aspect that he's the only one that can deliver me. He's the only one that can break the chains of bondage. He's the only one that can soothe my soul. He's the only one that can send the rain. He's the only one that can let the anointing fall on me. He's the only one. He's the only one that can be my covering. He's the only one that can be your covering. And if you're looking to anyone or anything else, know this. You're on your way to a devil's hell. I told you I didn't come this morning to make you like me. There is a message to the church. We heard it about three months ago. God said that Wichita would be a fire starter for this nation. The Berean church is going to have a significant part in that. So church, you better arm yourselves likewise. You better learn to seek God while there is time. Don't you're going to be left behind. In other words, I don't know exactly when, but pastor, we need corporate prayer. I don't know whether it's a week or several weeks, but corporate prayer is in tune. For when we first got saved, those of us that's over 20, well, let me back up a little bit. For those of us that's over 30, well, let me back up again. To those of us that's 40 or older, we can remember when revivals lasted a week to sometime months, every night of the week. And we watched the movie of God. Sick bodies were healed. Blinded eyes were opened. Dem demons were cast out. The church flourished and birth was given. Now when you take a look around us this morning, there might be 20 children, if that, over in children's church this morning. And you look at us. Children, grandchildren, Great grandchildren, where are they? There was a time when our children were in church with us. Parents, grandparents, it starts with you. Do you spend time praying with your children? Do you spend time praying for them? Do you spend time living a righteous life before them? Do you spend time training them in the ways of God? Or do you just bring them to church and let somebody else do it? Do you just send them to church and let somebody else do it? God is not pleased with you if you're sending your child to church and you're sitting at home doing nothing. Amen. Note this. You're not the servant of God you think you are if you're doing that. I'm just going to be flat out honest with you. There's no pulling punches here. Church, we are too close to the end of time to be wasting time talking about 
Will the Lord know my heart? He also knows that you're a liar. He also knows that you are a self-deceiver. And there is nothing worse than a person who deceives his own heart. You cannot make it in by not blaming others, but yet you won't accept the responsibility if the failure is you. It's not in God, it's in you. Did you do what he told you to do? Did you do it the way he told you to do it? Then step back and see, won't God make a way? See, we want to talk about breaking chains and all kinds of things, but no chains are going to be broken until your heart first become broken before God. I heard this, I believe it was the psalmist said, a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. In other words, that's where you go to, that's where you're going to humble yourself before God. I heard the, the prophet Isaiah say over about the 58th chapter, he told him, he said, cry loud and spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion and show my people their transgression. But real and simply, if you want to see God move and bless, heal and deliver, Get on your knees and come before him in prayer. Offer up a sacrifice that God has required, that God is requiring of you. Not that I'm requiring, but that God required. In other words, to present your heart before him. I preached the message not too long ago. It said, is your all on the altar? But note this. I thought about, Pastor, the altar of incense. That fire was to never go out. We the ministry, many times, we serve as that golden censer that is to be taken throughout the congregation. But if that fire has gone out and we have chose to light it from somewhere else, not only the people that listen to us are going to be destroyed, but we also are going to be destroyed. But God will not accept strange fire. Don't believe it? Ask Eliezer and and what's the name? I forget it. And fit it. Off near and finish. Don't believe it. Ask them. Fire came out of the altar and devoured them. Right. Ministers, preachers, teachers, who, wherever you are, if you fail to teach the word of God as it is in its purity, know this. The word of God is against you. And your judgment slumbereth not. He's coming. And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We'll have, to, we'll have to slow down just a little bit. And then I'm going to have to pick up again. But I wanted to deal with just a little bit of something here that's found in Second Chronicles. There's a precious mother here that posted something on the prayer chain a few months back. And before that, the Lord had been dealing with me that the Lord wanted to bless in this place. She didn't know it, but he gave her virtually the same thing he gave me. And that prophecy that came from that young man on that Sunday, a few days after, I believe she posted that, came in and gave us that prophecy that God was going to move in this place. He set his approval upon it. But church, in order for that approval to stay and to remain, you're going to have to get right with God. You're going to have to do it now. You don't have as long as you think. Too many of us think, oh, I've got plenty of time. Give you all an idea, maybe of how old I am. Maybe I shouldn't do that. But I thought about something my dad said. He said people had said that the Lord is soon to come and that we're living in the last days. And he said they were saying that, Pastor Rodney, back when he was a boy. Well, if he'd have lived to see the 8th of November of this year, he'd have been 115 years old. So see, you don't have as much time as you think you have. It's shorter. Somebody said we're in the 11th hour. Somebody said it's five minutes to midnight. Your midnight might be in the next five minutes. 
you don't know when or where God is going to call you home. So prepare to meet your God. But in that seventh chapter, beginning at the 12th verse, and the Lord answered Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself as a house of sacrifice. Somebody want to take a look up here? What does it say? He said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. What did we have the past year, church? Before that, in all out west and even down to the southeast, we had droughts. But I forget the particular writer that wrote that there would be a famine in the land. And it would not be for food, for bread or water, but famine for the word of God. Preachers quit preaching a prosperity gospel. Preachers quit preaching philosophies of theology and get the reality of the theology that you're preaching. And that can only be determined by illustration, demonstration, and the power of God being manifest in and through your life and those that hear the gospel that you preach. And if you wonder why so many of us are sick, diseased, what kind of gospel are we hearing? Be careful what you hear, but you better hear. Ask God to give you a spirit for the discerning of spirits so that you will know. See, so many people feel like because they say, well, the spirit gave me this. What spirit gave you this? If they speak not according to this book, and you find that, I believe, in Isaiah about 8 and 20, or Jeremiah 8 and 20, 19 through 20, they're lying. there's no truth in them. But some of us have gotten to the point that we go to spiritualists. We go to soothsayers. Some of y'all have no idea what I'm talking about. That just simply means when you get up foolishly, say you're a child of God and go read your horoscope. That just simply means when you get up and go follow all these astrologers and these so-called scientific things, and yet none of it has brought you the things that you're saying that it's supposed to bring. Only God can bring about your deliverance. And one thing is certain. He can allow certain and swift destruction to come your way. In the 37th Psalm, he said, he saw an individual, we say, spreading himself like a green bay tree. But lo, in a short time, saw him and couldn't find him. Sometimes we see the powers and the workings of Satan, and it is so miraculous that it just boggles the mind. And this person, as we say, and when I say the workings of Satan, I'm talking about that individual who is spiritual in nature, but does not have the power of God flowing through him. And we watch him rise and go up. Many times people are building ministries on gifts. It's not God. Many times people are building their ministries and lives and reputations on inspiration. And Oh, he inspires me. But the point of it is this. What happens when they're not around to inspire you? Do you have enough common sense to get on your knees and say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, all those things that I heard that person say, God, I can't find, I can't seem to find my way. We grow weary trying to follow all of the fads that come along. But you've got to stay in him. You have to let him dwell in you. He wants to dwell in you richly. You've got to quit segregating yourself. And I don't mean black and white. You've got to quit segregating yourself. I don't mean just in denominations alone, but I mean right here in the Berean Assembly. You've got to get rid of your cliques. You've got to get rid of your little so-called friends that I only associate with these people because they see things my way. No, if you don't see it God's way, you're on your way to a devil's hell. It's that clear-cut and simple. It's God's way or no way. 
Some people say it's God's way or the highway. No, it's no way. There is no other way to God other than Jesus Christ and the price that he paid on Calvary. Some of you feel like I just can't live this. You better back up and read some scriptures. Okay, and in the 14th verse it says, If my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will heal their land. It's not enough for you to repent, but you've got to turn. I don't mean a 10 degree turn. I don't mean a 45 degree turn. I don't mean a 90 degree turn. 180 degrees. Turn from sin unto righteousness, which only comes through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood on the cross. If you do not come that way, you come as a thief and a robber, and he's plainly told us that no thief, no robber is going to abide there. So just know where you're going if you don't come God's way. And in the 15th verse, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayers that are made in this place. And this is what I thought about when what mother said. In this place. Some of y'all don't make it to Tuesday night prayer. Some of you don't make it once a month. Some of you don't make it once every two months to prayer. That tells me how your spiritual life is going. I'm not your judge. The word of God is. When you forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And I'm going to tell you. You deceive yourself when you think you can walk in here. And I'll shout John. And John been here all the time. On his face seeking God. When there's an anointing upon his life. When he walks by. And says, and says to this brother or that brother or that sister. Be thou made whole. In the name of Jesus. And a week later or a few days later and sometime instantaneous, they're healed, delivered, and set free. And you've been praying for six months and ain't nothing happened. You see, you can't serve God and do his will without any signs of his anointing resting upon you for long. If you think you can, you're self-deceived. For I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. I heard the prophet Jeremiah say he's placed it in an earthen vessel, God's treasure. His spirit, he's placed it in me. He's placed it in you. He wants to dwell there. I heard, I heard Paul pick it up, I believe, over in the book of Romans. This treasure we have in earthen vessels. I heard Jesus, I heard Jesus talking about it. And I heard John Mark say over in the 15th, well, actually, let me, let me just throw this scripture at you. John 7, 37 and 38. He said, and on the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried with a loud voice and said this, He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, healing, deliverance, the binding of Satan, the, take, the taking and putting away of serpents, moving in the midst of his people. And then I heard John Mark say over in about the 15th or the 16th chapter, Mark, down about the 16th through the 18th verse. And he said this, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall speak with new tongues. If they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They shall take up serpents. In other words, the the things that the enemy has planted in your way to destroy you, the enemy that has come to afflict you, God has taken them out of the way. 
and they cannot stand the anointing of God. For where the anointing of God is, there is liberty. And if you don't have liberty and you're bound, surrender and yield to him and deliverance will come. Too many of us don't want deliverance because we feel like it's going to cost me too much. Well, know this. It wasn't too much when he hung on that cross. It wasn't too much when his blood back was laid open with stripes. And by his stripes, I'm healed. By his stripes, I am set free. By his death, I am delivered. By his death, I'm sanctified. I'm cleansed. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And if you are not a new creation in Christ Jesus, you're nothing. But you have an opportunity this morning to become a new creation. You have that opportunity. There are some things that I kind of like to touch on. I don't know. I, like I said, I told you I didn't want to be here this long. Because these notes I haven't got to yet. But that's all right. Whether I get to them or not, you need to know God and the parting of your sins. You need to know that God is your healer. He's your deliverer. He's your protector. He's your provider. His banner over you is love. He says to the devil, he's mine. Do what you want, but you don't touch his soul. He's mine. And if you will surrender to God, you can turn around, look the devil in his eye, and say, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke you. Take your curses and go. You have no place here. But many of us, and I've been there on occasions, Pastor. Sometimes I've been down on my knees praying and I can begin to sense the presence of God. And the next thing, I sense the spirit of fear that is so strong, it almost makes you want to quit praying. But then I have to get mad at the devil and let him know. You're a liar. You were defeated at Calvary. And through his shed blood, by his grace, you got to go. And it ain't long. Sometimes it's just a matter, as we say, as I begin to confess that. Oh, but what I like about the God I serve. This happened to me about 40 years ago, Pastor. I was going through some things. And I felt almost like giving up. And I kind of was crying and whining and talking to the Lord about it. And I heard him say this in Isaiah 65 and 24. He said, I heard you before you called. And I answered while you were yet speaking. Makes me think about Daniel. He prayed. God heard him the same day. God set the answer the same day. But it took three weeks before Daniel got the answer. Because Satan desired to hinder the messenger of God. Church, don't give up. Keep on praying. Keep on holding on. Keep trusting. Keep believing God. For he will provide. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What did I commit? The keeping of my soul. God is able. Too many of us want to give up when the going gets hard. My mother used to call them fair weather friends. We had friends growing up as children. And most of you all will know what I'm talking about. We had friends that said, I'll be with you through thick and thin. Things got thick, they got thin. Don't put your confidence in man, for confidence in man is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. You find that in the book of Proverbs. That's not Blackwell 101. That's God's word in the book of Proverbs. But then there's another scripture in the New Testament. He said, cast not away your first confidence. Don't you cast away the first confidence. 
that you placed in that. And I'm not talking about that wouldn't be. But I'm talking about in the life that Jesus Christ lived on this earth. The price he paid for your salvation. Don't you cast it away. Don't you count it as a light thing. Because it was not. God wants to dwell in you perpetually. As we say, continually. For he said in the New Testament, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth. See, too many times God gives us his peace and we give it away. Because I need to deal with this. Let me tell you, if God can't deal with it, you can't handle it either. But you have to trust him and give him time. See, there was a song they used to sing back when I was a kid. Say, you can't hurry God. So you'll just have to wait. Trust him and give him time. No matter how long it takes. Say, for he's a God that you can't hurry. He'll be there. Don't you worry. Say, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. See, some of you all, I believe, know what I'm talking about. Others of you all just sit there and wonder. But let me tell you something. If you put him to the test, he will prove to you. He's on time. See, you won't have to ask the children of Israel. You won't have to ask Daniel. You won't have to ask Peter and Paul. You won't have to ask Grandma. You'll know for yourself how he abides in you. Amen. You see, somebody sung another little song said, He abides with me. He gives me victory. He said, God never fails. So he said, just keep the faith and never cease to pray. Just walk upright, both day and night. And he'll be there. He will be there many times before you can call. Because he's an on-time God. I thought about this as we say common synonyms that are often used when we talk about something being perpetual. We think of constant. We think of continual. We think of incessant. We think of perennial. But these are things that, that, you know, sometimes we get caught up in words and we say, well, that ain't exactly what that means. But I'm going to tell you what, to the child of God that knows God, whatever is spoken, the spirit of God that is of God will interpret it. It will make it manifested to the hearer. If you say, I don't hear, I don't understand. James said, if any man like wisdom, I believe that's about 1 and 12, he said, let him ask God. For God give it to all men liberally and abrade it not. In other words, he doesn't do it by partiality. If you ask, God will give you understanding. God does not send his word to fall upon deaf ears. And if you go, you hear this, and you seek God, and you've been seeking God for weeks, months, years, and the revelation has not come, there's one or two things you can do. Cast it aside. I say, Lord, help me to empty out that I might receive that which is of you, that I will know beyond the shadow of a doubt whether it was of you or of man. See, but most of us are not willing to pay that price to find out whether it was of God. Because it don't line up with what I want to do. As I said earlier, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he said, I'll be with you always. But he did say this. He said, but I will send you another comforter and he will abide with you forever. Whatsoever I told you, he'll bring it to your remembrance. He will, gu he will guide, he'll be a guide for you. He'll be a teacher for you. This is what we learn when we look at Acts 1 and 8. Where we talk about 
the paraclete coming one called alongside, the Holy Spirit that comes to help us and to aid us through whatever trials and things that we face. He's there to help us. Acts 2 and 4 gives us to know that when they were fully come, let me just back up just a little bit. If you begin roughly at around the first verse, and it tells you about how that they were all gathered together in one place. But we're in assembly, we need to gather. We need to assemble. I told Pastor Rodney this morning, you were treading on, bad ground, on dangerous ground this morning. I told Pastor Rodney, I said, I wish he'd quit preaching my message. I hadn't talked to him. He didn't know anything, but his first five minutes up here before he took the offering, can I say it, y'all? I know many of you all ain't familiar with this because this is black terminology. He was meddling. He was meddling in my message. He was all in there. He was stirring a nest. But note this. If you walk away from this message, you're not walking away from this man, this church. You're walking away from God. Jesus said this. Or rather, I believe it was John who said this. He said, if they had been of us, no doubt they would have remained with us. When you start walking away for selfish and personal reasons, know this, you're out of the will of God. And I don't care who we are. I don't care how once anointed we may have been. When you start walking contrary to the will of God, rather than getting on your knees and seeking God, and if the if pastor's wrong, if I'm wrong, whoever is wrong, Lord, open his eyes. Lord, give him to see the error of his way. Lord, if it's me that's looking at this thing wrong, Lord, I repent. Lord, you restore me. Lord, touch me. I told a friend of mine one day, I say, I was sitting up there one Sunday, right over there, and I sensed the presence of the Lord, and this was what he said to me. He said, or should I say I said, or the thought that came to me was this. Lord, help me to judge nothing before time. And only then through the eyes of your righteous judgment. As Gamaliel told that Sanhedrin council, when they wanted to beat and threaten Peter and John, he said, brethren, take heed. If this thing be of naught, be not of God, it will come to know. Otherwise, you be careful lest you be found fighting against God. Told someone not too long ago, this. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I don't care how justified I feel in my anger. See, because before I got saved, you slapped me, I slapped you back. But see, after I got saved, I took a few slaps. Had to go off and cry, Pastor, because I was angry. But the point was, I love that person too much today as I do anybody else. I've been done wrong by many people. But I ask God, Lord, you help me to humble myself. You help me to do hard trials and tribulation. Somebody sung another little song. Said, through hard trials and tribulation, persecution, I'll be faithful. Will you be faithful? of the persecutions and trials that you face. Will you be faithful? For if you are faithful, God will give you a crown of life. Paul said, not only is there a crown laid up for me, but to all of those that love his appearance, to all of you who will live where God will have you live, there is a crown of life when you come God's way. And if you would, so many times I quote scriptures. Sometimes I just feel like quoting them is sometimes people don't have time to write them down. But if you write down this scripture and you can read it when you get home. Galatians 2 and 20. It said, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life Christ wants you to live is the same life that he lived when he walked this earth. 
He lived a holy and righteous life. He did no sin, and neither was there any guile found in his mouth. Check yourself, saints. What's coming out of your mouth? Check yourself. What kind of life are you living before your neighbors and your friends? Or do you put on a mask and walk in here on Sunday morning thinking you have the church to see? Know this. God has some people here that sees beyond that mask. And he knows where your heart is. Brother Zach, if you would put John 12, 35, and 36 on the screen, I just kind of want you to take a look at this. What Jesus said. You see, too many times we get caught up in things. He said, a little while is the light with you. He was speaking of himself. Walk ye while you have the light, lest the darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goes. While the Spirit of God was here moving in this church, we suffered some things. But we continued and God blessed us. But when fear came in, and when things caused the church to be shut down. We relaxed our guard. We quit praying. We had more time to pray at home than ever, but we refused to pray. We refused to stand in God's word. And in Psalms 53 and 5, it says, this. he said, there they were in great fear where no fear was. See all those people that ran out and was trying to get shots just as quick and as soon as they could get them. I'm not accusing them, I'm not blaming them, but note this. How many of them wound up with it anyway? There are those that are saying, as soon as this booster shot comes, I'm running down and get it. That tells me your faith ain't in God, it's in man. Where is your faith? Some of you all will probably remember back last March or February when they first started talking about, and they were talking about this. I was, and when, as we said, all they wanted to do was, and, and I told them, Pastor, I said, not that I'm anybody, I said, but you're going to have to learn to do like Paul did. Shake it. Shake it off. In other words, those people that were around, when that viper came out of that fire and latched on to Paul's hand, they knew he was a dead man. As they say, that's like being bit by the king cobra or Oh, what is that brown snake in Australia? Basically, if you ain't within the doctor in 10 or 15 minutes, forget it. Stick a fork in him, he's done. <laughs> you see, some of you all don't know, but I'm a country boy. I come, from, I come from the country. We used to do some weird things, Pastor, as kids. We fed... We would take chickens that had been on the yard and we say we would put them up in what we call coops. We fed them, we, and we say, and we fed them grain and corn, to, as they say, to clean them out. Then after a few weeks, we took them out. Sometimes we went and rang their neck. Sometimes we laid his head on a chopping block and then just watch him. And then sometimes, being mischievous as kids will do, we'd go get a bucket and put by him, and when he hit the ground, and he, sure enough, sometimes they didn't hit the, they didn't kick the bucket. But other times they didn't, we said, well, that's another one that kicked the bucket. But if you don't follow God's way, you're going to be one of those that kicked the bucket. You're going to be out of here on a one-way ticket to hell. And that's a sad place to go. And there's just a, like I'm saying, there's so much. But throw up for me 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3, 4, and 5, I believe it is. I'm coming to a close. We'll get there later than sooner.
says, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to those that are lost. To those who have accepted the tradition of men more than the righteousness of God. And in, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, who shined unto them. How is it that you had this light and now you've turned to walk in darkness and you're stumbling and falling, don't have sense enough to turn around and go walk, to walk back in the light. But I heard Jesus say this. He said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are sinful. And if you're not willing to repent, you'll keep walking in darkness. You'll keep going away from God rather than running to him. Too many times. Ask yourself this question. Is the gospel hid from me? Have I closed my eyes to the light of the gospel? Am I willing to pay the price that I might be the servant of God? And I think I would just read these notes and close. The message we preach and teach must not be for the platitudes, the philosophy, and the theology of man. Must not be. But it must be in power and in demonstration. The theology is fine as long as we preach the theology of God and not man. And then it is to be demonstrated in power. In other words, it is to be seen. Jesus taught the people, but when they didn't get the message through what he taught, he turned around, Pastor Rodney, and he told them this. He said, if you don't believe me or in me, then believe it for the very works there. They couldn't deny the miracles. Some tried. But they couldn't deny it. The work speaks for itself. When you've spent time alone with God, it's evident to those about you. Amen. See, you cannot spend time alone with God and, he, and him not manifest himself to those with whom you come in contact with. You see, that was what those, that Sanhedrin council said concerning Peter and John when they healed the man at the gate called Beautiful. They say, we can't, we can't deny that a notable miracle had been done. But rather than to let the people believe and to take on all of this, let us threaten them straightway. In other words, they beat them and threaten them and said, don't you preach or teach no more in that name. Oh, today, where, where are the Peters? Where are the James? Where are the Johns? When they said, whether it be right for us to obey man or God. Said, for we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. The things that be of God as preachers, we have to stand and declare it. You as teachers sitting out there in the audience, you have to stand and declare the whole counsel of God. Whether the children like it, the parents like it or not. To the praise and worship team, you have to sing and praise the goodness and glory of God. Whether people like it or not. Because that is the task to which God has called you or appointed you. And if you don't do it, sin lies at the door. It is not enough to know the purpose of our lives. We must strive by the grace of God to fulfill that purpose. See, you to strive to enter in at the straight gate. For broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and narrow and straight is the gate that leadeth unto life. Christ purchased this liberty for us by or through his life and death at the cross of Calvary. So you must choose who you will serve for God for God's grace and mercy and love 
are everlasting. The fire of the altar of incense was to never go out. The spirit, you should never let the spirit of God wane in your life. You should trim that wick so that the weights and the sin don't suffocate the spirit of God that's in your life. We do that by searching his word, by getting on our knees and praying, by fasting and seeking and humbling ourselves before him. And now, can I do a little something that one of my favorite cartoon characters used to do many years ago? Some of you in here won't know what I'm talking about, but others will. Well, you'll know it, but you, may, you probably won't know the character. And Pastor, he said this. That's all, folks. God bless you on this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your people will be blessed, that they will be stirred. Lord, that they will come to a closer walk with you. Knowing that you're the only one that can deliver and set them free. And Father, these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.